play those games because they just feel assaulted on there. Well, like they, they get on and like right. they understand that this is going to happen. That's the culture. Man, I'm a but, 40 year old white male. I feel yeah. assaulted well, by what Jim just said. <laughs> This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris discuss games with stigmas and try to get to the bottom of why some do and do not have them. Plus, a table talk double feature and a video game spelling game. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 67 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, guys. And we're joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And our media topic of discussion for today is going to be games with stigmas. Uh, Doc, do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? No, I really don't. Uh, Which is, of course, a pun. Yes. (laughs) Because uh, I came across an article this week, which was... uh, the sort of the top 10 uh, games we don't admit we play and it really got me to thinking are are there any games that i don't admit that i play Mm -hmm. as it happens uh one of the games on the list was minecraft Hmm. and it also happens that over the last few weeks i've uh, brought up a minecraft server one that i'm actually curating and paying for and building a, a little town called sponton and uh bringing in some of my friends and it's a private server and we're having some fun But what I was kind of surprised about this time when I was telling people that I had a server is the sort of negative reaction to the game, Mm. which apparently I've been living under a rock or maybe a one meter cube of (laughs) some sort of stone because uh, turns out there's a stigma with Minecraft. Oh my gosh, I had no idea. Anyway, um, so it really really got me to thinking about some of these games like... um, uh, Pokemon and and various other things that have a stigma. So, ooh, <laughs> stigma games. It's almost going to be like a confession yes. hour for JRPGs. Have somewhat of a stigma for some people, um, especially anime related JRPGs. Yeah, um, some, some Sonic games even have a stigma for some reason. Man. I don't understand. Dating Sims. Yes, yes. So <laughs> that uh, might be a topic in itself at some point. The juicy <laughs> stuff is coming up. Stay tuned. Yes. All right. Uh, but first, we're going to start with uh, some of our opening segments, and today we're starting off with table talk. <laughs> It's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. I've actually got a couple of things I want to talk about on the, on the Table Talk today, because I've had a chance to play some neat new games. Apparently a lot of Kickstarters have delivered. I don't personally participate in the Kickstarter phenomenon, and I will rant on that in a moment. But uh, I have a lot of friends who do, and this gives me the benefit of being able to play games that I have not overpaid for. I mean, uh, <laughs> paid, paid for. Um... The first one I want to talk about is uh, called Over and Under. And this one's actually been out for a little while, but the thing that caught my attention was that it actually has a book of tales that comes along with it. Um, you now, this is like rat tales sort of glued into the... Uh, no, no. It, it's, it's a tome of oh, stories. Like, uh, tales from the Arabian Nights? And that's oh, exactly okay. where I was going with that. Is yeah, uh, Less creepy. Tales, tales of the Arabian Nights is sort of the classic um, uh, the book of tales book. It's currently under publication by Z-Man Games. Mm. Fantastic bo- uh, game. I recommend uh, everybody picking it up and playing it. Um, but one of the things that it kind of suffers from is a, a non-cohesion problem. You kind of have to make up your own little tale as you go along to, to glue it all together, and there's not really any crunchy mechanics that go with it. No decision making per se. Um, this wasn't the one that we played, the the Arabian Nights game that we played? I imagine it was. Oh, this, this was the same Yeah, okay. yeah. It had, if it had a storytelling element in it, yes, yes. absolutely the one. Um, but, but the thing about Over and Under, which is really the one I want to talk about, is that it combines the mechanics of a resource Source management with storytelling, mm. and so the the sort of meta narrative that, that comes along with it, the story that comes along with it, the the hook, if you will, is that you're this little tribe and you got chased away by the evil barbarians, and so you went over mountains and you went over plains and you went over all these scary, different, unhospitable places over the river through the woods. Yeah, until you found this wonderful little glade. You built your first house, and then you discovered that underneath it is this massive network of caves caverns, an entire civilization of creepy things living down there. So what you have to do is um, 
sort of recruit different um, members of your village, go ahead and build on top, but then also explore down underneath. And when you explore down underneath, you get a story element. You make a decision. And the decisions are very simple. And you say, I'm going to uh, attempt to roll over this certain amount. And then you roll, and based on the abilities of those people that you have recruited, you might or might not succeed in certain things. Um, your reputation might go down if you kill someone you shouldn't have killed. It might go up if you killed the, uh, the terrible, stinging uh, underground wasps uh, and helped everyone out. Or, you know, other other. Call them stats, if you will, are going to get affected by this. The cool thing about it, then, is once you've explored an area, you can actually develop it. You can build down there. And that is where the resource management stuff uh, really shines because you've got an economy that's built into it. You can buy from other players. And you kind of get this very um, condensed version of some of the the great games that are resource management like Agricola and that kind of a thing. Now, some people hate Agricola, so I, <laughs> I hesitate to even mention that one. Um, but I'd, I'd cite like Pillars of the Earth as another great one nobody's ever heard of. Um, along with some of those storytelling elements that, uh, and that's my two favorite mechanics of all time. So uh, over and under, check it out, pick it up. Uh, it's well worth it. I'm looking forward to expansions because they've got to come. Very cool. The second uh is not going to be quite so nice and quite so forgiving. Um, I I have, as I said, a lot of friends who uh, are into Kickstarters, and I don't fault them for that. There's a there's a fun sort of Christmas element to Kickstarter, right? You pay for a thing, you forget about it, it shows up a year later, and then it's like, oh wow, I remember I backed this thing, and here are the seven boxes with all the and, expansions. And you're and talking specifically about board. Games. I'm talking about board games specifically, yes. Um, and, and and I think that if you get on like the board game groups, the ones um, there's a really big one on Facebook called the Board Game Group, and, and they talk a lot about this. There was a post just yesterday about I think I'm addicted to Kickstarter, and the big thousand post response to this whole topic of being addicted to Kickstarter board games, um, and so it's a thing. And what um, what I responded to that on that post was there's a there's a problem I see with Kickstarter board games specifically that I like to call the uh, stretch goal game. Mm -hmm. And the stretch goal game basically can be described as if we reach this, we're going to shove extra shiny crap into the box. We're going to give you this scenario. We're going to give you the ability to play with four players instead of uh, three or six players instead of so and so, and so the one I'll pick on um, is a game that I actually really enjoyed called Avalon's Legacy, mm. and Avalon's Legacy has the King Arthur elements in it. Uh, it's got a, a hex-based tile exploration system. It's got this really great uh, character-driven system. It's got all the narrative stuff and the locations that you would expect from a King Arthur-based uh, legend. Of course, being Avalon, that's the, right. the hint there. Mm-hmm. Um, but what it's also got is, if you back the Kickstarter, about seven boxes of extra crap. And we played with a six-player variant, which is, um, oh, add two players and add an extra quest. And the 90-minute game, assuming you know what you're doing, <laughs> turns into a six-hour game. Oh, wow. If you're lucky. <laughs> oh, and that sounds very bloated. Yeah, and this is the problem, is these games, and like I said, I liked this game. It was a lot of fun. I don't ever want to play it again, not with six <laughs> players. I'd like to play it with three or maybe four, as it was originally designed and intended. Mm-hmm. But I think a lot of these games are being now over-designed. They're suffering from a feature creep of, okay, if we if we shove a bunch of really ec- cool extra stuff in there, then maybe we'll get extra funded. We'll get super funded. Mm. We'll get, you know, all this, this wonderful thing, and then we'll deliver by turning the paper tokens into metal tokens. And some of them are, I don't know, they, they, they feel almost um, like carrots. You know, just little golden carrots. And some of them are kind of interesting. But the problem is, in the old days, ten years ago, five years ago, you had these major corporations that were curating the games that were being released. And the main game, the box that you come with, uh, was itself an easy-to-understand and even the complicated ones, fairly easy-to-learn game that you could play three or four times and get. 
and then six months later, the expansion would come out. And then another few months later, the expansion would come out. If you look at the sort of the release dates of everything that was Mansions of Madness, you can see how this pattern came about. And there are tons of expansions for Mansions of Madness, and I love that game. It's great. The problem is, if you have every expansion of everything all at once, you're kind of tempted to sort of play it all Mm -hmm. big box style. Yeah. And you look at it and you go, well, I think I'll just play the the simple iteration. You might not even get to the expansion stuff. Mm -hmm. And so you never really learn the basic rules. And it's almost guaranteed that you are playing some element of it wrong. Mm. And and you've got the, let me go look that up phenomenon. You've got the, oh, let's do the extra thing with this extra dragon. Oh, wait, we we didn't beat this scenario because it was the hard scenario and we didn't realize it phenomenon. And a list of other things. Could you compare this to, say, um, if a film comes out and they decide, you know what, we're going to release the, like, seven-hour, all-the-extra-footage version to theaters as opposed to just releasing the actual film that's, like, two hours long? Yeah, I think that's a great comparison. If the uh, Lord of the Rings or the Hobbit movies had had the extended editions in theaters, I don't think they would have been nearly as popular. Mm -hmm. Um, I personally like the extended editions, and don't get me wrong, I love expansions and games. I even like little shiny bits that replace paper bits. Mm -hmm. My actual complaint is, whenever you get it all at once, I think that we are encouraging uh, over-designing of these games by backing with the Kickstarter phenomenon. And I I think this is occurring across the board. And I've been picking on board games, but I think video games and and other things are suffering from it too. It's the idea of, uh, I'm going to throw lots of money at this so that it becomes really, really cool when the basic game itself could have been so elegantly simple and so wonderful Mm -hmm. that somehow that part is just getting missed, even to the point of being um, just a disappointment. And I would actually point at the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game that's about to come out as one I fear is going to suffer from that. Uh, Mm -hmm. Or the Ghostbusters game that just came out. You played one scenario of the Ghostbusters, you've played all of them. You really have. It's the same mechanic repeated over and over and over because what did they waste their time on? The models, uh, the the extra scenarios based on the same materials, all this stuff. And they spent all their time on that instead of designing a game that could have been a lot more interesting and complex as a base game. So, in the end, uh, my my verdict on Avalon's Legacy is, yeah, great game, play it, but set aside all that extra junk learn the game, play it three or four times, and when you're tired of it, bring out the expansion, and it will enhance the gameplay in wonderful new ways. Avalon's Legacy is to the old Shadows Over Camelot as the Mansions of Madness game is to House on Haunted Hill. It's time. For Game Show, where the backward compatible crew play a game show kind of game on their gaming show. What sort of crazy game show challenges in store this week on Game Show? Let's find out right now on Game Show. By the time that this will be coming out, the National Spelling Bee will have been probably a month or two ago. Um, so what we have is video game themed Spelling Bee, and Doc and Jim McKee are going to be the ones uh, competing. Um, and I want to see your phone at all times, Jim. No, we're not. We're not. We're not looking. At, <laughs> I'm not going to look this up. These are probably going to be. My guess would be not a single one of these will be real words. Is what I'm going to guess. Yeah. So what I've got is a, a list of ten things, and so I've we got can contest a, everyone. I've got I've got a list of ten words, and rather than trying to put them in an order that would be balanced. I'm just going to roll a d10, and whatever number it lands on is going to be the one that I use for the current participant. Sounds oh, fair. Clever, yeah. Um, and so, these are all uh, names of things generally from video games. Uh, about half of them are names of developers, and about half of oh, them are... Oh, names of developers. <laughs> oh, and about half no. Of them are... The Japanese ones are going to be... <laughs> I'm terrible at names. I can't <laughs> spell names names, at names of things from I got horrible this. names. I got this. So, I don't got this. Um, so, how about you guys go in and roll a d10, and whoever goes higher will get all right, I got a seven. Beat that. He beat nine. that. <laughs> <laughs> so Jim will be going first. Okay. And great. we're just going to go back and forth, and we're just going to count how many you get correct. Uh, no chance to steal or anything like that. So I'm okay. going to roll the d10. 
Okay, Jim, your first word is Blazinski, as in Cliff Blazinski, the founder of Epic Games, lead designer of Gears of War and Gears of War 2. Oh, you're killing me here. Am I able to write it down as I say the word? Uh, if you guys are both okay with writing, I'll allow writing. No. No? No, no writing. This is spelling bee, sir. <laughs> There's no writing in spelling bees. Ah, oh, okay. Otherwise, it would be a writing B. Oh, uh, let's see. Blazinski? <laughs> Blazinski. Cliff uh, Blazinski. Okay. That sounds delicious. Do I have to spell Cliff, too? No. Okay, good. Good. Okay. Uh, B, okay, so B L I um, Z I? N. Let's see. I know there's a C in there. I can't remember where it was. Ah, uh, S K I. I know that's wrong. There's a C. There's like a C in there somewhere. You are sadly incorrect. <laughs> yeah. Blazinski is spelled B L E S Z I N S K S K I. Totally yeah. knew that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, Doc. You're yeah. up next. He's, he misspells his own name. I'm terrified. Eight. Uh, Tektite. A recurring enemy in the Legend of oh, the series. See, I know that one. Oh, come on. Uh, he gets see. an eight, and that's easy. Oh. It's in no particular order. Uh, T-E-C-T-I-T-E. No. Incorrect. T-E-K-T-I-T-E. That was my second uh, guess. See, I knew that one, but I can't steal. Oh, <laughs> oh well. All right, so the score is a nil-nil. Oh. Jim, your next word is homunculus. Oh, God. Okay. As in the monster, or specifically the spelling comes from the monster from the Dungeons and Dragons 1986 creature catalog. Oh, great. It's also in Small World in one of the expansions. <laughs> yeah, but it's been in a lot of games and they spell it differently, so this is kind of tricky. Okay. Um, well, he cited his source. Humon- so. Use it in a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> you encounter a homunculus, it attacks. What do you do? Okay. It's like a text based adventure. <laughs> <laughs> um, H U. M O N C U L U S. Very close. Uh, it's L O U S. H O M U N C U L U S. You just had the O and the U reversed. Oh, uh, okay. Wow. Okay. All right. Wait, it's not. It's a homunculus, not humunculus. Homunculus. But I thought it was supposed to be like a human. You know. I guess. No, it's a homon. Apparently so. I thought it was like a human Well, when you think about it, the, the root word homo, as in, like, homo sapien. Oh. Awkward. I, I thought it was humo, <laughs> human, like, like Quark from DS9, the humans. No? Yeah, okay. there you go. All right, there we go. <laughs> All right, Doc. The Zhitzniv. Alexi. Bless you. <laughs> Good luck, Doc. <laughs> Bless you. Uh, let's the, see. The that creator be, of ten, Tetris. That would be what? Creator of Tetris. Re- <laughs> that would be Russian. Um, it would be Russian. Say, say it again. Pajitnev. Alexi. Can, can I get it in a sentence? <laughs> Alexi Pajitnev was the creator of Tetris. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I can't help laughing. So I think it's word. I think it's P I J I T N E V. Incorrect. You were close though. P A J I T N O V. Ah, I was close. That was close. I had like four letters wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but it was four out of like seven letters. So. <laughs> You're on the right track. Oh, you wanted me to spell it in English. <laughs> oh, see, I was spelling it in uh, Russian. <laughs> the backwards R. You're spelling it in um, Cyrillic text. Yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jim. We are still tied nil nil. <laughs> Quetzalcoatl. Oh, man, I had a cat named Quetzal. <laughs> it's a recurring demon slash persona from the Shin Megami Tensei series. <sighs> it's also a Mayan god. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, is, that's where it comes from. That's where it comes from, maybe. God, this word is so hard to spell. Okay, um, if, I, if I could write this down, I'd probably be able to spell it. But, okay, let's see. Um, Q-U-E-T uh, Z- E C O A T L. Oh, so close. I know, I know I'm close. <laughs> Q U E T Z A L C O A T L. Yep. Oh, so I just had one letter wrong. Uh, you, two, but. Yeah, two. No, no, I had one. It was, you, you, I, you had an E instead of an A. Yeah, you yeah. left the T out. And then you left the L out. Oh, the L out. No, no, I said the L at the end. It was a, there was an L before the C. Oh, there was an L before the C. Yeah, quite, so, oh, all I just qual. missed that when yeah. I was saying it. See, if I'd written this down, I would have maybe gotten it. Yeah, I actually had a cat named Quetzal. Very cool. When I lived in Guatemala. Would you have been able to spell that, though? Yeah, Q-U-E-T-Z-A-L, well, absolutely. He, well, that's a coddle. Mm-hmm. Well, you just add a quattle on the end. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> All right, Doc. Meyer, as in Sid Meyer. 
the oh. Legend of Civilization series. Ah, you've won now. This, oh, this, is that almost, one's easy. this is almost too easy. I know, it's not fair. Um, which is why I'm terrified I'm going to miss it. Nah. Because um, I think it's M E Y E R. That's too late. You've, you've now given your word, and that's incorrect. Yep. M I. Wait. M E I E R. Correct. Oh! I would, another one I would have got if you let me steal. That's two points I would have had if you let us steal. Yeah, but I had three or four. There's, there's not steal, stealing. So. That's, oh, these. come on. That's not If fair. you're going to make up numbers, I can too. But I'm actually spelling them before he says them. <laughs> is the difference. I'm proving that I'm spelling it before he gives it away. All right. Jim. <sighs> Zintetsuken. An ability used by the summon Odin in the Final Fantasy series. What in the hell? Say that again. Oh, Zantitsuken. Zantitsuken? Zantitsuken. I don't think you're pronouncing that right, because I've played all the Final Fantasy games. How do you think it's pronounced? I don't know. I don't, what is the ability? Who's, who uses this ability? Odin? Odin. The summon Odin. Zantitsuken? Zantitsuken. Zantitsuken. I'm pronouncing it Zantitsuken because I think that's the Japanese character TSU. So there's the hint. Z... A N T E C S O U K E N. Incorrect. That would be a, like a T Z U K E N, right? Z A N T E T S U K E N. Oh, ten. S U. Okay. Oh, and then S U instead of S. But the thing is, I will contest that mm. because there is no official spelling. Um, this is a Japanese word and therefore should be written in Japanese characters. <laughs> so I say that this word, that this should not even count. As but it's, it's in a game which has credits, and, and the it, credits are spelled. However, it was translated, and it was translated by. This you know, is, who this knows is who. using the, the English translation of the game. Yeah, see, uh, I don't know if this is the official way to spell it. <laughs> Contested, controversy. <laughs> <laughs> what is this, Scrabble? <laughs> Alright, Doc. Yeah. Desolée, Patrice. Creator of Assassin's oh, Creed. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, hey, this is his like, favorite game series. Oh, uh, come on. <laughs> D-E-S-L-E-T. Say that again. D-E-S-L-E-T. Incorrect. Really? D-E-S-I-L-E-T-S. Oh, French and your silent and, S. And I, I wasn't going to make you do the accent either, but there's an accent on the E. <laughs> <laughs> accent to the E. <laughs> All right, Jim. Okay. Hadouken. Okay. A signature move of Ryu and Ken in the Street Fighter Hadouken. series. I know Hadouken. how this is spelled, but the thing is, it's been spelled different ways, so I'm not sure if this is, this will count. Oh, that's your excuse for everything. No, no, I, I've seen it in books before, but okay. Um, H-A-D-O-U-K-E-N. Correct. Okay, thank God. <laughs> you got a point! I've seen point. it spelled there before, I just didn't know if, like, I know it's been spelled more than one way, that's why I was worried. A point has been scored! Woo! Yes! Okay. The crowd goes wild! <laughs> We should have three points if there were stealing rules, but okay. Okay. There okay. is one more. Doc. Uh-oh. Can I tie it? For the, for the tie. Pressure. Scheherazade. Character from The Magic of Scheherazade, 1989. Okay. So, S-H-A-H-A-R-A-Z-O-D. That's incorrect, but let me try. Um, S-H-A-H-A... R R A Z A D. Both incorrect. Is it H E R? S C H E H E R E Z A D E. What? Oh. But this is another one. See, that's originally in Arabic. It was originally, it was originally yeah. C O. Uh, oh. per- per- and that's also Persian. not how it's no, spelled Arabic. in Tales of the Arabian Nights. Right. It's Persian. There is no. Persian. It's a per- it's a Persian name. No, no, I know, but like the the letters are in Arabic. There's no like oh, Persian yeah. letters, yeah. right? It's I mean, like, like Shakespeare Arabic, Arabic spelled script. his name in like twenty different yeah. ways. Okay. Okay. There you go. So the winner is Jim with one <laughs> a thrilling <laughs> score. <of> one <laughs> zero. And oh I my God. a big fat goose egg. All right. It's like the the national spelling bee always comes down to like neither of them have committed a mistake. The first one to commit a mistake loses. Yeah. And <laughs> it's the exact opposite. Yeah. The first hey, one to get I'd like right. to see those national spelling bee kids spell some of these words. It's... I don't know if they could do it. This week's meaty topic of discussion. Okay, so um, Doc has has come up with our, our meaty topic here, and it's all about games with stigmas, like spelling bees. Uh, yes, like spelling bees. Uh, like the spelling bee game show had a had a pretty big stigma against it. <laughs> no, but games like uh, one of the examples that you used was Minecraft, um, and I did want to respond to that if I could because I personally. I don't necessarily think that that I have a stigma against people that play Minecraft. I'm not necessarily 
I don't necessarily look down on them, but I personally don't really care about Minecraft and never really have mm -hmm. had a, a much of an interest in Minecraft. I, I think if there's a stigma now, at least part of it's that it's kind of seen as a kid's game because it is so popular among kids. I would say that it is a kid's game. I don't think you can really argue that it's not. It is, that doesn't necessarily mean that's wrong. I watch, I watch cartoons. I watch some shows that are specifically aimed at kids. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything wrong with that. Well, have you played Minecraft? Um, I... Like once. Okay. I've seen a lot of people. So I play think it's it, probably too. a lot more complicated than you think it is. No, no, no. Especially I'm not talking you, about the complexity. Especially if you're into the mod community yeah. and, and you do things like um, Feed the Beast or Tech It. Right, but the modding aspect is not the game. That's a little different. Well, yes, it is. In this case, um, and uh, I think the modding. Are we going to get into the discussion how Minecraft is not really a game, too? Well, no, actually, <laughs> um, I mean, it even has an end state, and whenever you die, it's this game over. But it's very technically a game but you now. Can't, but you right. can't when, it, when it first came out, it was not. I, there's, a, there's a constant state of not losing, which is called not dying, and therefore, at any moment when you are not losing, you are beating the game. Regardless. Is real life a game, then? Yeah, actually, it is. Do you want to look at it? kind of what I'm getting at here. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to give you, you Minecraft you, as a game. You're, you're not giving me Minecraft, and you want me to beat you, is yeah. what you're saying. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna convince me that it's a game. I'm not trying to convince you, but um, what, what I am saying is this, um, that Minecraft in and of itself, I think, has gained the popularity that it gained because of its development cycle, mm -hmm. which was in alpha and then in beta and then in uh, release and is now in 1.94, mm -hmm. I think, um, to the point where that community has stayed strong with it and loyal to it throughout all of those changes. Um, I myself personally took about a three-year break from it and came back to it, and I noticed very, very dramatic the change in people's attitudes towards the game in those three years when those young kids began to grow up who were playing the game. Now, what's interesting is that this is a game that's fragmented because it's on um, it's on tablets, it's on consoles, it's on those things. And I'm with I, I am, and this is the only game I say this on. PC is the only way to play Minecraft properly if you're going to play the adult uh, version of the game. Is that because of the uh, better, easier to mod it? I'm assuming, well, or, either, that, or not modded, but easier to maybe build things. Or because uh, I know the I know the community is a big part of the success. Yeah, that it I know, is. and especially people like being able to show off their creations. Well, like the mobile version, for example, isn't fully featured. Right, uh, the that's console, the real the console reason. versions have some limitations, including a limited um, scope of the world. The world isn't yeah. like doesn't generate eight times the size of Earth theoretically. Or whatever. Well, there's is. a processing limit, right, on these other yeah, platforms. Yeah, exactly. So, like with a PC, you can mm -hmm. you can have you can host a server that can be. There's huge. a lot of valid reasons for it, but but the, what it really comes down to is yeah, there's the modding aspect, but more than that, there's the being able to jump onto a community server aspect, uh, because I think that ultimately uh, the game is about two things. It is about being an explorer game type and it is about being um, a socializer game type. And then there are other uh, things in it as well, such as um, achieving in, in that you set yourself a goal, that kind of thing. Mm. I play with very specific goals whenever I play. Uh, this last week I decided that I was going to uh, recreate Florence Cathedral, so I did so. Uh, I did it in sur survival multiplayer, yes, really. Um, and uh, I did it on a group server, and I did not use my admin powers for evil and not good. Uh, I actually went and mined the materials, brought it back, built myself a scaffold, did it kind of old school, and it took me about a week to do, um, in about what would be considered one-third scale of, of the actual cathedral itself. So for, so for the stigma, to get to, get to the, the specific, like, why you think there is a stigma yeah. against Minecraft? Yeah, tell me. Um, well, I was going to ask you, but I mean, because my initial thought would be because when it first came out, um, there were, it started, I believe it started circulating, and correct me if I'm wrong, started circulating in college communities. Yeah. yeah. And so later, once it started opening up to include the younger audience, uh, originally it was like, it felt more inclusive, it felt smaller, and so it felt like it was more of a hip thing. Once everyone was involved, including young children, all of a sudden it's no longer a hip thing, it became the thing that everyone's doing, and therefore it's not cool. Yeah. That's my assumption, but I'd, is that, kind is of that correct? I'd kind of compare Minecraft kind of on that note to Lego. Um, and well, I think, I think yeah, Lego is one that just has a digital Lego. Yeah, of course, it has less of a stigma than say Lego does, and it's because Lego's been around so long that all the adults today, you know, probably Work played kids. Lego. Yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Now there's um, actually Minecraft in Lego now, which is yeah. And I was going to raise the Lego games as having their own stigma too. Mm. Well, we can not that later. not the physical Legos, 
but the Lego the video, the video games. Lego. Yeah, that's true. Um, they do. Actually. But I think the Lego, you know, because you could sort of say, oh, well, it's just a toy. But it just like with Minecraft, there are people who take the same quote unquote toy and do really crazy um, stuff with it, like right. super complex models, or like they'll simulate things. They'll no, like machines. There's people that do, and I'm not denying that mm-hmm. at all. There's some people who mm-hmm. do very impressive stuff in Minecraft. Yeah, I mean, very mm-hmm. impressive stuff. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And the people that and there's some younger people too as well. Mm-hmm. Some kids that will do some pretty impressive stuff too. Mm-hmm. I just think that by and large, because, you know, Minecraft doesn't have the same sort of universality that Lego does, and it's not been around quite as long, you don't have an adult community that grew up with it and kind of turned into their own. I mean, you do with Minecraft, but it's it's, it's a much more niche thing. For me, the, stig- the only stigma that I would maybe have is if, with the young kids that play it, um, if ever I hear them say something like, um, they they are so into Minecraft, and then when they see an older retro game, and they go, "Wow, this the art's like Minecraft." That's the one thing that gives me the stigma because it's like, "No, no, you little shit, you're wrong." So uh, yeah, sorry, I'm, uh, that actually annoys the hell out of me when I when I hear something like that. Um, and of course, I've I've spent plenty of time in jail because of this, you know, just running around calling them little shit. No. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, now we know why parents don't hang around gym very often. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> That's why I work in educational games for kids. Oh, boy. No, <laughs> uh, uh, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, of course, kidding. I don't actually react that way. But I do. It, it does annoy me when I hear that because it is a very, obviously, an ignorant statement. Uh, but uh, not to focus just on Minecraft unless you have something you want to add. Well, Minecraft. no, no. I, but it is my guilty pleasure game, and I, right. I, I do admit that. And, and I was shocked having taken a big break from it and going mm-hmm. back into it, um, sort of announcing publicly on Facebook, hey, I'm back into this again. A lot of people going, wow, people still play that. Adults mm-hmm. still play that. <laughs> the same sort of thing mm-hmm. that, that I get whenever I talk about being an adult fan of Lego, mm-hmm. speaking of, uh, the acronym being AWFUL. Um, so I would love to challenge you to uh, admit your guilty pleasure yeah. games. I mean, I was going to say, and I don't play as as as, um, as much of them anymore, I kind of have gone back in and started playing uh, some recently. I don't know if these would count. Like, for example, I recently have been playing some uh, Bravely Default, because mm-hmm. I had bought it before, I didn't have a chance to play it, and I've been playing that when I have the opportunity on my 3DS, which is a JRPG. I do think that there is some um, stigma still against um, JRPGs, not so much for... Um, Younger gamers, especially teenagers, but once you are, you start to get older. You start to get into like your your mid twenties or even your thirties, which I'm now in. Um, there's there is that stigma of oh, these games are, are really meant for a younger audience, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So I would say maybe JRPGs count. Um, maybe especially if you're looking at something like uh, Persona. I think because the the idea behind Persona is that um, it is a it is actually actually a pretty complex RPG. Mm-hmm. Um, can be pretty hard, but it also has that high school simulation aspect to it. Right. And because of that, uh, and also this, there's also an element of um, relationship simulation. Not, and I don't just mean uh, romantic relationships. Actually, all sorts of relationships because you're always trying to build these friendships with people that mm-hmm. help you help you out in the actual battles when you go into the uh, the game world. Mm-hmm. Essentially, and all, the Persona games are all like this. And so that's another one that you could argue has this. At least I would build, I would think has the stigma from what I've seen. Um, as you start to get older, the idea is, why are you still playing those games? Yeah, mm-hmm. or even just the anime aesthetic in general, and with the Persona, high school thing again, yeah. plays into it. But and a lot of the JRPGs have anime mm-hmm. aesthetic as yeah. well. But, but just anime aesthetic in general, whether it be anime, whether it be games or anything, uh, inherently has kind of a stigma. And there's kind of like a very large group of gamers who are cool with that, and so mm-hmm. it's not really an issue. But there's also a very large group, um, gamers and non-gamers, who are just like you're into you know the Japanese. And, yeah, and, and would you say would you say some of the Nintendo games? in general, have a stigma among a certain crowd? I'll go one further. I'll say that having a, a Game Boy in your pocket of any variety is, of itself, uh, kind of a stigma. A 3DS? Yeah. Like any? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, when was the last time you saw somebody my age doing it? Um, when I went to go see this, I went to an MST3K show a couple weeks ago in, in a theater. And, and think about that context. I know. But and there, also, why didn't you old... invite me, you jerk? I'm sorry. I, went with some fr- I should have invited you, too. No really... joke! Have you ever gone to these live shows? They're yeah, really I have. Fun. They're fantastic. Um, yeah, so we went to one of these. It was for... Um, um, I can't believe I'm blanking on the name. It was the one with the like time travel... You know the one I'm talking about. Time, time Chasers. Oh, Time, time chasers. chasers, yeah. So uh, we went with... Uh, ta- for it's time no Man of Hand of Fate, but you know... No, no, no. I went to, I've been to that one before. Yeah, have you? That one's great. That's People dress one. up for that one. Uh-huh. I actually won a costume contest oh, yeah? doing that one one time. Yeah, I dressed up as Torgo. I was about to say, you definitely were Torgo. Yeah, pictures available on Facebook. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, I went there and there was this, this guy who looked like he was maybe 55, 60. Uh-huh. 
um, in a in a uh, wheelchair. I suspected he might have been a veteran. Mm -hmm. um, and he had a 3DS, and he was actually playing Bravely Second. That's actually kind of awesome. And you the have... sequel to Bravely Default. And I struck up a conversation with him, uh, me and the, the people that I was with, and we were talking about, like, hey, which which game is that? Is that the first one or the second one? What do you think of it? Uh -huh. And just conversation with him. About and you game. have successfully made my point. <laughs> is that a, such a such a niche person Very true. as that, you had to go to somewhere <laughs> as weird and geeky as a Mystery <laughs> Science Theater 3000 showing in order to be able to find an adult yeah. with a with a 3DS in their pocket um, or rather in their lap. And and it might I will say I mean the same thing but the, again these are these are you could say geeky too but I mean at my workplace a lot of the people there I've seen um, the younger folk that are in their like 20s also will tend to bring in 3DSs. I see them sometimes at lunch playing The younger 3DS, folk, yes. But you're right. But I say younger folk, that's compared to me. They're still in their 20s. Yeah, absolutely. But we're talking, about, late 20s too. we're talking about a system that has had iterations ever since, man, ever since I was in high school. That's when the first Game Boys came out. Yeah. Um, and, and so you've got people who, who literally were born and handed one. Right. And, and then they grew up with it. So they, it's different. And, and I think that as they grow up, the idea of having a handheld in their hand will, will change. And I think we'll see adults with well, that as they grow up in, we, in 10, 12 years. Years, when we say stigmas, are we talking about, and I mentioned this when we you brought up the topic, mm -hmm. are we talking about um, in the larger the larger scheme of society, there's a stigma against having your 3DS, your Game well, Boy, in or the larger, are we talking about among gamers? In the larger stigma of society, there's a stigma for being of a gamer that's at what I'm all. Saying. Right. So, that's not what I'm talking like, about. For example, Minecraft, I think, in the larger scheme of things, probably has less of a stigma. Right. But if you're talking about... In, in Among same, gamers, it right. has a much higher one. And that's what I'm thats what I'm wanting to focus on, is that you you tell someone that you're a gamer, and then you tell them what you game, and it's like, oh, you're sorry, one, you're, you're one, one of those. those. Yeah. But, I, but see, I would disagree <laughs> saying casuals. that a handheld is, is something that you would get. There would be a stigma against for gamers, though. I don't think that's true. I think gamers... When you're talking about a handheld system, including the 3DS, I don't think there is that stigma. I think there is, and I think I think it's along age lines. I really, really do. I think it's along age lines. I've just not experienced that. Well, so there's also kind of like you get into some weird divides, like PC versus console. That for sure. There's yeah. a stigma there. Like for example, the the, the whole playing an FPS on a console. There's definitely a stigma there mm -hmm. among um, gamers that have been playing for a long time. Um, that recognize that the superiority of playing with the mouse and keyboard, and there's yeah. those that just that just don't, <laughs> yeah. and they're just these ignorant fools that, that play with a gamepad. Yeah. <laughs> all, right, all, right, all right, all right. So, so let's keep it simple but, here. But I, I do think, though, that like you know, to your point, Doc, <laughs> that you know, there are I think a lot of people in a certain age range that do still see the value of, um, say, a 3DS. Yeah. Because they recognize that there are some you know good games for 3DS, but I think there are a lot of older gamers who see handhelds as being a primarily younger audience. I, I'm still. Waiting for who these people? Because I honestly don't. I, I, I'm having trouble thinking of examples of that in particular. To mm -hmm. be honest with you, because in all the circles that I've that I've seen or, or situations, the only people that I've seen that have actually sort of thought, for example, a 3DS might be weird, would be actually younger gamers. I, yeah, I don't know that because not older gamers. It's more like younger gamers that are that are um, not even as interested in. Um, sort of these varied gaming experiences, they might only play, you know, mobile games on their phone or something. Uh -huh. they're, they're less familiar with playing a dedicated game console. I, I think that's there's... The take, that's where I would well, think... I think there's there. maybe less of a stigma and more that older people, especially like once you get past your 20s, just don't have handhelds as much. Yes. Because they might not see the value in paying a bunch of money for that platform for games that they don't really care right. about. Right. They're more likely to have a console. Um, but I think, I think there's an, another layer beyond that too, Chris, which is that... Um, people who are older, let's go ahead and say in 30s, 35 maybe is the break point. I'm not sure exactly what it is. Look at someone who is who's in their 20s and, and is surprised that someone that old would be using a handheld gaming device. And and I think there may be an element of being treated like a, a, a younger person than you are mm -hmm. um, by having that kind of a thing. And it plays into the millennial stereotype, which I as I understand it, millennials hate. <laughs> um, with the the idea of you still live with your parents, you still uh, you know play video games, you still all these do these things. You don't have a real job. You never work. You know, and it's like go you know get you know get grow grow up and get a job and and, and get a haircut. Says the guy with the ponytail, <laughs> um, and 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 ditch your your handheld device. You know, I think that all plays into the stereotype, and and therein which, is stigmatized. which I find so strange though, because then those same people that will say that will play games that are 
frankly, garbage on their, you know, phones. Oh, I agree. That are, that are, and, I'm not, and I'm not saying that, that every game on the phone is trash. I'm saying that people that will say that will play games on their phone that are trash. Yes. Mm-hmm. Which, which I find very ridiculous. It's like, well, it's okay for them because they're just playing in, like, short bursts, mm-hmm. and, you know, it's like this game that only costs them, like, you know, a couple of mm-hmm. dollars or something. Mm-hmm. No, but you're, you're dedicating all this time to a to a bad experience when you can get a better experience with a dedicated handle. Yeah, and I think we're getting to kind of a point that we'll probably we probably would have arrived at later anyway, and that's that a lot of these stigmas are very much based on personal perceptions of things. Of that's course. very so, true. And you know, everyone kind of has their own reason for gaming their way. It's that's like, right. you know, I like this type of game because I don't like this type of game. Of course. Or I use like, you know, like your point is that, you know, a three DS is a dedicated gaming platform and therefore it's gonna have games that are made for gaming mm-hmm. and not just for paying a fifty extra fifty cents every two minutes. It's well, and, mobile. <laughs> but, and it's not just that. I think a big part of it too that helps is that you know, and maybe this this is probably dating myself too. I like buttons. I like the feedback, you know, the haptic feedback of pushing buttons, right? And, and having a D pad or having a um, an analog stick and move and being able to actually interact that way. Whereas on a, a touch screen, unless they design the game specifically to take advantage of that, which unfortunately a lot of them don't, you end up with a game that is just um, not good. The controls are not good. They're Mm -hmm. not really well designed. And that's what happens when you have these games that are ported over to to mobile that were originally on a handheld system, which has happened quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Whereas the games that are are designed for touchscreen, which you actually see more of those on like a 3DS, for example, or the original DS when it came out, you had games that were designed specifically to take advantage of the touchscreen controls. Then those could work pretty well. So I think I would almost say that the mobile market doesn't evolve. This is sort of a broader topic, maybe, but it's not evolving because it doesn't need to, because yeah. they're able to take advantage of people that are actually ignorant in games. They don't know what a good game is and because they don't play them, and so they just get these uh, short experiences, and they think a game is something that I just play for like 10 minutes while I'm waiting at the bus stop, and it's a short little experience, and that's all I care about. So they're willing to pay this little amount of money without realizing, without recognizing that what they're playing is um, essentially an oversimplified piece of crap. Mm-hmm. And you can tell me I feel very passionate. About this. How do you feel? About this? Uh, no, and I'm not. And I do think that there are some mobile, some mobile games that are very well done. It's just the problem is that if you don't have that, you know, breadth of experience, or you may not, you haven't played a lot of games, you may not understand that what you're playing. You could be playing something much better. Is what I'm getting at. Gotcha. They're, they're able to feel this way that like, oh, this is pretty cool because they have such limited experience playing games that to them this becomes this novel right. experience and it's great. Just and, like everybody who plays with an Xbox instead of a uh, on a PlayStation. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> there is that stigma too. I think. With, well, that's with where I was consoles. going with that. Actually, and, it's a um, subtle uh, change of so, topic. So we've talked some, and okay, so uh, some other games. Let me think about other games that might have well, similar stigmas. Well, I got, I got a good one. for Sure. You. Okay. Um, you you mentioned um, kind of the the, the kiddish games like uh, the Lego games and that kind of a things. So what about the complete opposite end of the spectrum? The the, the pervy ones. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, Dead or Alive, Beach Volleyball, yes. Bayonetta, Lollipop Chainsaw, that kind and, of a thing. And you know? I would say Bayonetta doesn't really have that stigma, and that's because of the the pedigree of the um, the designer. The, I mean, the, it was Platinum Games, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, they have this pedigree. Their, their their design team was originally, I believe, the ones that worked for Capcom that did like Devil May Cry and stuff like that. So they and have. I've this, actually like you know some people might argue that. Just based on initial impressions, but people have played the game. People who are in game studies have actually lauded Bayonetta as kind of a feminist game. Exactly. So it's it's not, it, and they, they kind of play up to these stereotypes. But regard, but that aside, Team what, Ninja boob mechanics yes. is what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, I'm, my my whole point with boob, mentioning boob physics, which boob sort of physics, yeah. separating Bayonetta is just the notion that um, it has such a strong, such strong, tight, um, you know, action gameplay that. It sort of is able to not to escape a lot of that criticism. Whereas you have something like you said, Dead or Alive, Beach Volleyball is one where you know people. That is a game. Uh, it's fan Where it's like, yeah, it's it is a it's a fan service game, and there are actually a lot of um, um, and more anime focused games too mm-hmm. that do the same thing. Where right. it's like it's there's a game element, but there's also this little extra element of. You know, you can see women in skimpy, mm-hmm. you know, bikinis or skimpy outfits, or a little bit of extra element there that. Um, could be could does have a stigma associated with it. You're right, mm-hmm. and I think honestly, a big part of that just kind of falls into. Um, I think a big part of it is like this kind of like uh, I, I would say Puritan, but I, I think it's more of this like almost everything coming back around again, like a neo Puritan attitude is what mm-hmm. I've described it as before. Um, well, there's I, also you talk about it where it's like people basically just they see it as something some something that is sexy, or they mm-hmm. see see a woman that's sexy, and they immediately think, oh, this woman is this woman is sexy, therefore this is a sexist experience. Well. 
Not really. I mean, that's just your sort of the way that you interpret it. That's your own personal baggage you're bringing mm-hmm. to it. Just because something is sexy doesn't mean it's sexist. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that there's that sort of element that is coming into it. But there's the stigma from these people that don't necessarily play these games. And for me, it's like with Minecraft. I don't particularly like Minecraft, mm-hmm. but I certainly wouldn't want someone not to be able to play Minecraft just because I personally don't want to play it. Well, sure, yeah. So I, I do think that when we talk about these stigmas, it's important to have this, not to fall into this attitude, even with games we don't necessarily like, like some of these mobile games I don't necessarily like, mm-hmm. to fall into this trap of going, well, you know, I don't like it or I don't approve of whatever this is, therefore you shouldn't play it. Yeah. That's nonsense. You should play whatever you feel like um, you enjoy playing, you like playing, whatever has value to you, but you should I do encourage people to have a broader experience mm-hmm. and not like if you're only playing games like this, like Dead or Alive, Beach Volleyball, and, and these games that have <laughs> these very fan service and like um, sort of like um, what's what's the word I'm, I'm looking for? Where it's um, um, I, erotic is too strong. It's like uh, titillating. Yeah, that sort of not titillating is not the word I was looking Erogenous? for. Erogenous? Uh, no. Um, uh, what's, what's the word where it's like, like I don't know, softcore is not the right word, but something along those lines. Erotica? Where it's like, yeah, erotica, maybe, I don't know. But this idea of, you know, it's not it's not a porn game. You're not, this is not, this is not a, a pornographic game. Mm-hmm. But this is an experience where you're expected to, um, you know, see girls in, it's like, it's like Baywatch. Mm-hmm. It's the, the TV comparison, the best comparison I can think of is Baywatch. There's a story going on in Baywatch. There's action in Baywatch. There are dramatic scenes in Baywatch. There are also plenty of scenes with uh, women in skimpy, skimpy outfits, wearing their bikinis, running on the beach. And, and men, too. Topless, running on the beach. It has the something for, for both of them, yes. <laughs> so so my, point, my point there is that you know, there's many different reasons to watch Baywatch. But really, most people are watching because there's, you know, there's attractive women running around, or there's attractive men, whatever you're into. And that was the main reason why Baywatch was, had, went on for, like, what, eight, nine seasons. So... It's, it's fan service, I think, like, mm-hmm. like Chris was saying earlier. So yeah. That's kind of what it is. It's like the people who play Dead or Alive Beach Volleyball yes. without having actually played Dead or Alive. Yes. Which is actually a really good fighting game. It is. It is. And so that's what I'm saying. So it's like, but I, I do want to have that separation there where we're talking about these games that are that have erotic elements, but that's not the main, necessarily, that's not the gameplay. Yeah. We're not talking about a pornographic game where the gameplay itself is sex. Well, let's let's stick a pin on that because we've got uh, episode 69 coming up here pretty soon and we're going to be doing our uh, After Dark episode. Uh-oh. But, <laughs> you want to uh, you wanna listen to that one with the lights off? Yeah, you will. <laughs> um, but, but definitely... Put the shades, just put the shades up. You don't want anyone seeing it in your room when, <laughs> right. you're, when you're listening to this. Yeah. Uh, but let's do just a hard break here and, and talk about <laughs> another one, Sim Games. It's like, for example, The Sims. Mm. Or oh, Sim City. I, I've actually... And I think that's... I think those two are... are have a very different reaction from people. I think because so too. With the SimCity games, this I don't think it has the same sort of level of stigma. And a big part of that I think is because there's this element of building and city management. He's gonna be an engineer. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. And it becomes this now it's also, I would say, associated with a very kind of a nerdy experience mm-hmm. where it's all about building and managing your town, I mean, in your city and managing like economies and stuff like that. It's very it's a very nerdy the, the game is revered if not commonly played. Yes. And, and everyone kind of appreciates what it means to the industry yes, when, true, it yeah. when it first came out. But not a ton of people play it. They kind of just like admire it from afar. So, oh, yeah, SimCity, that is a good game. Yes. And then meanwhile, we've got The Sims, which is something that, that I actually will, will admit to having a stigma when I hear someone is playing The Sims. I go, oh, really? The Sims, really? <laughs> have you played it? Yes, I have. And I just did. It was not for Didn't me. Didn't do anything for you, huh? No. Now, I've played a lot of The Sims. Yeah. I played Sims 1 when it came out, actually, more than any of the others. But I played Sims 2 and some of the others that had goals. And, and I think, My wife loves it. Yeah. She, she'd play it all the time. I think probably. that's a, a part of it. I do. I do feel you know. Without, I don't want to necessarily you know classify everyone this way, but I do feel that uh, the Sims games um, do appeal, generally speaking, more to female gamers than male gamers. Usually, I could see that um, argument. Um, my, you know, I've I've certainly met a lot more um, female gamers that are into the Sims than male gamers. So, and and I think I think that is just in part because of uh, what the game focuses on, and that there's a lot of like. Um, you know, building and like like having your your characters doing things that you're in sort of in control. You kind of have this god mode kind of atmosphere to it um, that I think is interesting. But it's like everything is so mundane in The Sims. I think is why I don't like it. Mm-hmm. Whereas when I play other simulation games, which I think also has a stigma. For example, um, let me say uh, uh, sports games. Mm-hmm. Playing any sports games, I think, has a stigma among certain gamers as well. Because if you're there's this idea of oh. You play sports games, mm-hmm. right? I mean, oh, I, think, I agree. And so that's something and, we, we had a whole episode about this, right? And yeah, I like yeah. the I like the simulation aspect of sports games the most. Mm-hmm. But that's something where it's like it's it's, it's similar to The Sims or SimCity, where there's a simulation of something. But I'm, this is a simulation of something totally different. 
sports related things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's that extra element, or even something like, for example, um, Football Manager, which mm-hmm. is something that, that I know we've talked about a little bit, where this is a you're not even playing the sport itself. Mm-hmm. You are doing you are running a simulation where you're managing a mm-hmm. Football club. Yeah, I think there's, um, and this is actually something Doc, you and I watched this talk by, um, I think it was Jason Vandenberg, if yep. I'm remembering his yep. name correctly. Not, and, not to be confused with Jason Vanderbeek from <laughs> Dawson's Creek fame. Yes. Uh, is that your guilty pleasure TV show? <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go into it. I have for some reason <laughs> episodes of that show burned in my mind because my sisters used to always watch it. We had like one TV downstairs uh-huh. that had cable, and it was like. Sometimes you just have to watch what they're watching. The sister factor. Yeah, the sister factor. Uh, I actually wrote an article kind of related to this. Damn you, Pacey. Uh, I, I wrote an article kind of related to this that I posted up on our uh, our bonus section on backward-compatible.com. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically, I took this talk and some of the ideas I got from this talk and applied it to characterization and games. But what he was talking about is how different people's personality can influence the sort of games they're into. Mm-hmm. And one of the... the I think that's very true. One of the spectrums that he was looking at is the difference between um, fantasy and realism. It had to do with the the aspect of openness to experience, specifically your degree of imagination. So you've got people who are more into their imagined world than they are into the real world, and vice versa. And that's um, why I think, and I think, I that, think that, that can explain yeah, Sims very exactly. well. That so can the explain the, the, the Sims. A lot of people who, what they find cool about the games is that it relates to their real world. And yeah. so maybe it's their real world and then it's kind of like a spin on it, where it's like, it's like the real world, but here's what I would do if I was in complete control of everything. It's like black and white. Mm-hmm. Black and white is is another sim, mm-hmm. it's a simulation game, another sim game, mm-hmm. but you're managing heaven and hell. Right. And that's something that's going to appeal more mm-hmm. to people that are into the fantasy aspect. Right. It's, it's almost like a, a, and I actually did enjoy that game, and mm-hmm. that's kind of like a, you know, fantasy version mm-hmm. of The Sims. Yeah, so a lot of kind of like, quote-unquote, core gamers, the nerds, if you will, are going to look at people who play simulations, they're more lifelike, and say, that's so boring, why are you doing that? Mm-hmm. The people who are into those games are going to look at the nerds and say, you guys are such nerds. Why are you into elves and orcs and stuff? Yeah. Um, and so I think that that kind of just comes down again to personal taste. I think you hit the nail on the head on that mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really do. All right, so a close relative to that, then, is um, really bad games, whether they be bad simulations like, you know, Goat Simulator uh, <laughs> or, or Octodad, which has this weird kind of... I think the reason... In, in, yeah. Designed in badness. But Stop. I think the, the stigma there is because those, at least, at least my Im- impression of these, is that they're games designed specifically for meme purposes, mm. and they're designed specifically so someone can play play them on like YouTube and kind of laugh. Mm. But they're not, Simulator 2012, they're, man. Right. They're not even designed specifically for what they are. It's almost like they're they're not even designed to be a good game from from the get go. Yeah. So to me, those games are straight up bad. And if you enjoy playing those games as opposed to watching someone else play them. Uh, yeah, I don't have anything good to say about it. <laughs> I mean, it's just because you're, you're playing, like you said, you're playing an intentionally bad game. So the only way that that's fun is if you're playing um, with other people watching. And you're, and you're laughing. Or, yeah, or you're watching someone else play and laughing about it. It's not a game that you play, by, even, though it's, even though it's a single-player game. And, and you don't yeah, play see, it by yourself. Yeah, I could see myself amusing myself with, say, Goat Simulator for, like, maybe five, ten minutes. That's what I'm saying. Five minutes is one yeah. thing, but this is a game that is... Yeah, I'm so not, not going to play So is, is, this, is this what you... Or, we talked about Mystery Science Theater 3000 mm-hmm. earlier. Is this why you think that is successful? Not because the movies are bad, but because we are watching them lampoon those movies? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So there's a kind so it's of... A sim- it's the same thing as what I'm saying. It's those a simulated are- social uh, element right. overlaid upon the yeah. badness. Yes, and I've watched those some of those games that you've mentioned, specifically yeah. Goat Simulator and mm-hmm. Octodad, other people playing. On Let's and, Plays. Yeah, and that's where it becomes yeah, sure. an interesting experience, but the game <laughs> itself, yeah, the game itself is what I'm saying. You just you sit down and you play that game, and to be fair, you're those, done in five minutes. And those games yeah. are self-aware. Like, Goat Simulator has kind of some parody elements to it, where it, like, really does, yeah. it, it sort of like does the Tony Hawk thing, where like it lists like the move, and you get like multipliers and points for doing things, and you're trying to like get a big chain well, of crazy so goat stuff. I think that we've reached We've now reached the point. I didn't. I, I, I guess I realized this on some level, but it didn't click. But uh, we've reached the point where we now have um, intentional, you know, B games, like mm-hmm. B movie style games. Mm-hmm. We're now at that point. Yeah. Not in the sense of the storyline is like a B movie. We've had those for a while. I'm talking <laughs> the gameplay. Is it's like a B movie in the sense that it is made intentionally to be bad, mm-hmm. and you're supposed to be entertained by it because of how bad it is. We're there. Go <laughs> simulator. It is Octodad. Yeah, yeah. We are now there. I didn't. I, I've, I've thought about that a lot about when we're going to reach that point. When are games going to become that self-aware and that we're able to make fun of them in that sense? That everyone's so aware of the conventions. We're able to do things like this, and we're able to get some sort of enjoyment out of a bad, intentionally bad game. Mm. We're there. We, we found that that. I don't know that magic formula. Yeah, 
<laughs> I think magic I think formula too. for the, terrible games. So bad it's good, right? <laughs> kind of an easy way, too, to figure out the games that kind of have stigmas is to think about the ones where you tell someone you play it and then you immediately have to say, like, you have to, like, apologize for it. Yeah. It's like, now I know it's got this and this and this about it, but I enjoy this part. Yeah. Like, anything you feel like you have to defend, there's some stigma. Well, I think, actually, I think they're the majority of stuff, depending on who you're talking to and the tastes that you know they have, mm-hmm. the majority of stuff that you talk about probably has some sort of stigma attached well, to it. Let me, here's another that I, I could think you could say um, that are certain games that maybe people haven't played uh, much of, but may have been so different. Like, for example, um, that, games that people have a, a misconceptions about. Mm-hmm. For example, Zelda 2 on the NES. Very different experience from the original Zelda. When it first came out, it was very po- it actually was a very popular game. But ever since then, in the years that have passed, people have sort of lost that knowledge, and they sort of look back at it as, this is a very different game. A lot of people haven't played it, so they just think, oh, it's not a good game. They play it for maybe five minutes or something mm-hmm. and realize it's not like the other Zeldas and put it down. You're right. So when I tell people, hey, this is one of my favorite games, it's a great game. Mm-hmm. You get this reaction from them. There's a stigma. Well, you like that game, but that's not really a Zelda game. Mm-hmm. So you have to kind of... There's that stigma, too, where it's like, no, if you sit down and you play the game, you'll see that even though it's not like the other Zeldas, it's actually a well-made game. Mm-hmm. So you have to actually play it. So I think there's games like that. Uh, what is another one? Um, I've heard uh, Dragon's Dogma referred to in similar... Like, have you played uh, Dragon's Dogma? No, not, no. And this is a game I actually haven't played myself. But the reason I wanted to bring it up was because I've heard people a lot talk about it as this kind of like you know niche experience where it was a really fun game in part because of the way that the story presented itself in like almost a satirical way. Mm-hmm. People didn't play it because they didn't get what it was trying to do. Mm-hmm. Um, there's other games like that where... Um, uh, what's the, what's that one? Uh, God Hand mm. uh, was a game that I think had that sort of stigma where um, it, when it came out, it's a Capcom um, um, action game mm. and that came, was on the PS2, I believe. I don't know if you all played it. Um, but it was a, it was intentionally designed to be an over-the-top um, action game. Um, kind of like, like very over-the-top. And it was actually pretty fun. Um, very arcade feel to it. And um, a lot of game review sites didn't quite get what it was trying to do and they get, it got a lot of bad reviews. And because of that, it... Um, also has this stigma associated, from, again, from a lot of people that haven't played it. So I think one of the issues with this stigma is if people played the game more, maybe they would understand it better. And I'm sure, Doc, you could make that same argument for me. Maybe I should play yeah, yeah. Minecraft more than I have, which is not much. Maybe I would understand the appeal a little bit better. I have a server now. Feel right. free to jump e- on. <laughs> even if I don't necessarily enjoy it myself, it might help me understand why someone else does. Right. And so now we're getting into like you know serious real talk life truth the life truths <laughs> here with uh, I want a hug <laughs> with like just people like needing to understand the other better and being empathetic and you know not the empathy not not, not, not not judging without understanding do, better. Do we want to talk about games like for example the uh, what was that that recent one that that mobile game that got so much attention the Kim Kardashian dress up makeup game or what's that game called that uh, I don't yeah there's some no idea what you're it talking got about. super super popular for like really? a, like a very short window it was extremely it was like the top and mobile looks, game yeah I, they're, they're, I think they actually played a little bit of that on game grumps or something was that just fan service because you could take your clothes off no no oh, not okay. at all it was specifically aimed at like um teenage girls really even money I, I would even say like preteen girls yeah, yeah. interesting Interesting. Well, let's go the, the other direction. This one's for you, Jim. Extremely violent games. But see, those, I don't think there's a stigma there, yeah, there among is. gamers. Oh, absolutely there is. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think that the uh, there's, there's an acknowledgement and an understanding that these games are not for kids. Of course. But kids play them. Well, but that's... Kids play them because their parents are not aware of what they're playing. They're not paying attention to the rating system. We right. haven't we haven't the ESRB. It's like the same the same thing with kids that bring their kids into an R sorry, parents that bring their kids into an R rated theater. Right. If they do that that's on the parents. That's mm-hmm. not the kids. It's an R-rated movie. You're not supposed to be bringing little kids into it. So it's the same thing here. If you have a mature rated game and your the parents are buying the kids and I've seen this in GameStop before. You know, I've gone into a game store before and I've seen parents that will buy like for example Grand Theft Auto mm-hmm. for their, you know, 10-year-old kid. And I don't think you should be doing that. I agree. But at the same time, that's not that's not a problem with the game industry. That's a problem with the parents. Game industry is doing everything they can, just like the film industry is doing the same thing with with these rating systems. But what about the games that are created to be ultra violent? I mean, we're talking like Grand Theft Auto Five. Well, yeah, and Dynasty Warriors, Dead Rising, Dead Island, that kind of a mm-hmm. thing. It's this Doom. Di- I'm we gonna, talked about yeah, Doom last Doom. week. I'm gonna, yeah. you know, I'm gonna jump on within a minute. I'm gonna be there, blowing heads off, guts mm-hmm. and gore going everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I have a two-year-old in the house. I don't play those kind of games. Mm-hmm. So you could say maybe that, that the stigma exists more among. There's this recognition of 
I know what this game is, and so I'm not going to um, play it or talk about it around a certain audience because they may not it they may not necessarily get why I play it. Like yeah. for example, some of the things that you do in, in, in Grand Theft Auto, and the reason why I want to focus more on Grand Theft Auto than Doom is because I think it's a little even though Doom is much gorier than Grand Theft Auto, you are killing demons. You're not killing people. In Grand Theft Auto, you do actually kill people. And yeah. you do actually torture people. Specifically in Grand Theft Auto five, there's a there's a very graphic torture scene. That's a narrative yes. element. Though. And it is very disturbing. But yeah. no, but you you specifically torture them though. Well right, but but regardless, that's a part of the narrative. It's not like you can just go choose I think I'll go torture some some random people today. True. But you could, you know, pull out a baseball bat and run up to a random person well, and yes, start you beating could. them to death. Yes, you so could. this is something that you that you can do in the game. Yeah, certain, you're not encouraged to run around and kill random people. Well, this is well you kinda are. No, you're not. i I've, I've been playing these games for a long time. You you were never encouraged to run up to a random person that that completely innocent person and kill them. You are, you are free to do that. You are free. That's 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 All a big right. difference. And the reason that you are free to do it is because one, you are you are a criminal. You are mm-hmm. you are someone that that breaks that does not uphold the law. And two, you are in a sandbox environment where you can do whatever you want. So would you agree with the statement that the purpose of these games is to provide verse, bursts of violent catharsis while vegging out after a long day? No, I disagree. Okay, completely. And this is, and again, this is something where for, uh, Grand Theft Auto. I think the only cathartic element in Grand Theft Auto is that you feel like you have um, freedom from freedom from some society rules in the sense that uh, for example um, let's say you're you're you know you're riding around and you know a cop tries a cop is going to pull you over or something like that because you ran a red light you might feel um, oh, I don't have to pull over in Grand Theft Auto. You can just keep driving. You can you can outrun cops. It's really fun, by the way, in GTA. This is something I love doing mm-hmm. to drive by, hit a cop car intentionally, so they so they come after you, and then just tr- outrun them. You know, right. and like things like that are fun because. So I do think that there is some cathar- catharsis there where you're sort of like bucking society's. Tr- tr- um, um, society standards, but when it comes to things like I'm gonna I'm gonna get some sort of catharsis from running around and just randomly, you know, killing people. Not really. I mean, I know some people may do that to an extent. I do. I I won't lie. I do run people over sometimes mm-hmm. because they're crossing the road. It's like get out of the road. I'm gonna run you over. So things like that. I guess you can say a little bit. There. Okay. Then then contrast that with something like Call of Duty, which also has its own stigma. Yeah. Uh, how is how are those games different? Uh, stigma wise. Uh, well, Call of Duty, I think, actually has another stigma related to it, and Which that's is? well, I don't play Call of Duty, and I kind of neither do I. Don't respect people that do, I right? Guess you but could why? Say. Because it's like well, it, it's, I think it's more... baby's first FPS. I mean, if I'm going to say it in like the, like the most <laughs> I'm going to say it in the most internet way pa- pa- possible. The, the truth of the matter is, FPS has been around for a long time before Call of Duty. Yeah, um, Call of Duty came around and sort of like basically was a big part of this dumbing down of FPSs where mm-hmm. everything's like squad based, regenerating health, all these like little things that, that turned turned the game from a run and gun fun action experience to this um, a lot more um, deliberate experience. The the and I have played Call of Duty the earlier ones quite a bit. Um, the multiplayer aspect of it became instead of the, uh, the, the eighty twenty rule. The games are multiplayer. Yes, yeah, but the but the eighty twenty rule is something I wanted to talk about because mm-hmm. the, originally in, in FPS there's this concept of a of and this is throughout multiplayer games mm-hmm. the eighty twenty rule, which means you know eighty uh, percent of the time twenty percent of players are going to win, mm-hmm. or like twenty percent of the time eighty percent of players are going to win. The idea is that the cream rises to the top. Usually, you're mostly going to be winning if you're a good player. And significantly, mm-hmm. however, grant, uh, games like Call of Duty have been specifically designed to try to move that more towards fifty-fifty. They use all of these little cheats to try to make you know to do things like aim, like guide your aim, a lot more explosives and things like that 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 cause you to die even when you when you shouldn't. So it makes things like having a streak that was completely viable on say Wolfenstein, Return to Castle Wolfenstein, uh, about fifteen years ago, you could have a streak of like. Um, one to 50, like fifty to one, or like a hundred to one. Even it's very rare, but you could even do like a hundred to one. If you were really good, you'd, you'd get around fifty to one. If you were one of the best players, you'd get like a hundred to one, which means you'd kill a hundred people before you die one time. Mm-hmm. Nowadays on Call of Duty, you can't do that because of the way the game is designed. Mm-hmm. If you have like a two to one ratio, that's like you're good. So that's something where I think that's why I kind of look down on those sort of a game, and I think that's a different reason from something like. Um, Grand Theft Auto, however, to sort of answer what I think you were trying to get at, Doc, is a little bit different, was uh, Call of Duty is a military simulation, Mm -hmm. whereas it is different from your literally acting as a criminal. So there is a little difference there, where I, I, I will say that this is something that the media gets wrong about Grand Theft Auto a lot, is that Grand Theft Auto does not encourage you to kill innocent people. You can 
but it doesn't encourage you to. It encourages you to kill other criminals. So when you're actually playing the game, if you choose to walk up to some random person and kill them, you can do that. But there are negative repercussions for that. It is never encouraged to do that. If you do that, the cops will come after you. If you do that, somebody else will try to kill you. That, essentially, because cops will try yeah. to kill you in this game. I've so, heard that argument for right, a long time. They are not encouraging you to do this. In fact, they're doing the exact opposite. They're discouraging you from doing it. And just because you get money from killing some random person, which you do, the amount of money you get is so insignificant. It's like you find a quarter on the ground. Because if you get, like, $200, that $200 is nothing for someone that has, like, millions, which you generally have in these games. Mm-hmm. So there's no real in- incentive to do that unless you just want to be a jerk and you just want the cops to come after you. And I, I would say that the, the feedback, the inconsistent feedback between both encouraging and discouraging you to do these things mm-hmm. by both punishing and rewarding you for doing these things is, in fact, the gameplay, the core of the gameplay itself. That there's a, a key psychological element of, I'm going to get away with something bad and not get caught. That's true. That they have tapped into, and that's why the game is so successful and so brilliant. I agree. I agree. I agree completely with you. And I do I do think there is that element of wanting to, to be in this, in this this environment where you can... Um, be a horrible person. You can be a very a horrible person, a villain. Yep. You can do some terrible things, but ultimately there are no real world consequences. That's true. You are not really hurting anyone. You are just playing a video game. Going going back for a moment to the Call of Duty thing, I think another reason the Call of Duty has a certain stigma to it is the multiplayer community. And I think that you know even even <laughs> among true. even among yes. gamers, not yes. even among people who aren't gamers who just find what they do disgusting, which I happen to as a gamer. <laughs> Dota. Um, Dota. Um, but they. Like it's the whole like culture of like pew 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 three sixty no scope MLG four twenty mm-hmm. blaze it, um, well, like that. that or if you sort or of... if you lose, there's there's like you know racial racial epithets thrown about. Yeah. Or um you know they they will they will shout horrible things. They'll say I'm going to kill you. I'm gonna break I'm gonna break into your home mm-hmm. and like shit down your mouth. Mm-hmm. I mean I'm just I'm being specific here mm-hmm. because these are things that I've heard said. Yeah. That's lots of, lots so... of misogyny. If like because I've actually heard like girl gamers that I know who said they refuse to play those games because they just feel assaulted on there. Well, but like, they they get on and like. Right. They understand that this is going to happen. That's the culture. Man, I'm a but, 40 year old white male. But, I feel yeah, assaulted well, by what Jim just that's, said. That's, that's, what exactly. was, that's what I was about to say. Exactly. This is not. Let's let's be honest here because I've been I've been whenever I play these games too, it's the same shit. Yeah. You will get the same sort of reaction if you're a guy too, yeah. and they will say horrible shit to you as well. Mm-hmm. So this is not something that's like, oh, it, it, no, as long not, as you're a guy, not, you're not going to get these comments. Yeah, no. no, no, no. No, you still get the comments. And sexual comments too, by the way, yeah. because they will straight up say things like, oh, wow, you you fucking suck. I'm going to like fuck you in the ass, kind of shit. You get those comments. I'm being very very uh, vulgar here to mm-hmm. illustrate a point these yeah. are real things that real people have said yeah. so not me I've said you <laughs> no I, I don't I don't do that kind of stuff but oh like the Overwatch thing I mentioned yeah. last week and this is even people who are taking the time to type it out right you, right when like nobody uses the chat feature you right. know so it's like yeah it's, yeah. it's ridiculous um, my yeah. friend who played um, what was this game um, it's it's a one of some of the MOBAs that, that have been playing what was that one Heroes of New Earth he used yeah. to play that all the time and he would say that, that there was this common thing where whenever someone would be Apparently there were a lot of like Brazilian players that were not very like they apparently were not very good that would speak Brazilian or something or mm-hmm. Portuguese rather, and so whenever they would, um, there was this common thing. And here was New Earth when he was playing, they would people would start calling them like uh, Panoy, which is not even a term for Brazilian, yeah. it's like like Filipino or something. Yeah, but you've heard Filipino. of this, right? Yeah. Where it's like they used to do this in here was New Earth. They basically just call them very offensive, off- offensive, racist things. Not even describing their race. They're completely different people, um, just because they they thought that they were poor players. So this is something that goes on in these in these games. You get these multiplayer experiences, and a lot of this is because you have um, younger people, I think, playing, like 12 years old. Um, and I, I will I will freely admit that when I used to play a lot of these multiplayer games, I would make fun of other people, but I wouldn't use, because I thought it was just too easy to use, like, you know, something racial, something sexual. That's boring. What I, what I would like to do, and my friends and I would do this all the time, and this goes back to that Guild Wars discussion that we had talked about um, last week, uh, the Guild Wars discussion, but um, when I used to play Guild Wars, but it's this element of you want to insult them in a way that is creative, and if you do it that way, it becomes more fun. Mm-hmm. So we would try to come up with crazy ways to insult people where it's kind of funny and a joke, and it's but it's also incredibly insulting, but you're not using curse words, you're not using racism, you're not using sexism, because then at least you're being creative with it, and obviously it's still juvenile. I, I was doing it when I was a kid, of course, but right. my, my, point, my point being there that I think that that's at least a little more acceptable because at least you're not 
it's not vulgar, it's not, you know, sexist, racist, it's just, you're, you're still, you're still being very insulting, but you're insulting them, it's like, um, uh, what was that, in, that insult in, uh, Monty Python, it's like, what was that, your, your, your father smells of elderberries, yeah. and, and yeah. like that, that sort, those sort of insults, where it's like, your you're, mother was a hamster, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're being insulting, clearly, but it's in a way that is, like, playful, mm-hmm. and it becomes, it becomes part of the experience as opposed to because anybody can just call you a bad word. Anybody can just start sc- yeah. screaming. It, it's when, it's when it's you not... cross the line from kind of like friendly ribbing that exactly. guys will do with each other to like insulting, like personal, like it gets really yes. ugly. And I think that's where the stigma comes in for all these multiplayer games, and that includes MOBAs and FPSs. Mm-hmm. And I think when you have that experience, yet and GTA Online is another mm-hmm. GTA Online. I mean, I haven't I, I've played that very little, but there's a lot that goes on there, and that not even just. Um, the 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 any sort of like you know chat interaction but also physical like people will you know stalk you people will you know kill you and and come after you and do things like that are intentionally targeted towards you um so and and maybe and that's of course that's part of the game you could say or you could also say is that you know is that them basically harassing your in-game character maybe or is that just part of gta i don't know but because i mean i haven't played enough grand theft online to say but that's something that I do think has a stigma associated mm-hmm. with it when you play a game like that. Yeah. And I think we're kind of coming up against time, and I think mm-hmm. there's a whole lot more that we could talk about that we haven't gone to today. So maybe a future discussion. I mean, like, we didn't even get into role playing games and the stigma around those. Or MMOs. Or trying to even just, like, get people past, like, it's especially fun with the non gamers who don't know what role playing games are, and you say, oh, yeah, I'm going out to role play tonight, and they kind of give you this weird look. Oh, you mean, <laughs> oh, you mean tabletop role playing? Yeah. Tabletop. Oh, there's a big stigma. Yeah, yeah we didn't even get on, touch yeah. on that at all. Um, and so, you know, that, I think that it's a really mm-hmm. great pastime. It's actually one of my favorite ways to game because yeah. it's narrative and it's creative. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, especially because of, like, the D&D stigma of the past and now today, like, why are you playing those when you could be playing video games? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Well, and, the, and, the, the, and related, related to that, too, the um, MMORPG mm-hmm. as well has this stigma associated with it. Like, you're, it's like that episode of South Park mm-hmm. uh, with the Warcraft episode where it's like, how can you kill that which has no life? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, like, fat, balding, yeah. um, G- hat, G- like, on even Cheetos on like like laying on the side of his you know computer, not even like even mm-hmm. wanting to sit up straight. Kind mm-hmm. of this like oh, if you play an MMO, you're the, you're this, lazy and you're out of shape fat, and you're slob, eat terrible. Yeah. yeah, it's so there is that stigma as well, mm-hmm. even among gamers. Yeah. So yeah, well, if you want more on this topic, um, the article that I pulled this from is called 10 Guilty Pleasure Video Games No One Admits They Love uh, and it's by a stay-at-home dad uh, who is a gamer like myself named Jack Pooley mm. and it is on whatculture.com <laughs> <Pooley>. slash gaming <laughs> so go over to what we've been too juvenile today whatculture.com <laughs> what culture? slash gaming uh, search for that and then uh, go ahead and read the whole article so he, he does a really good job of I think mm. um narrowing in on certain things and he talks about some very specific games that we didn't even talk about like Square Enix and uh the Yeah, and I, I touched on that with the JRPGs, JRPGs, but yeah, we didn't we didn't really go into it into that. But. Yeah, so uh great great little article I think. Uh he knows his audience and he knows what website he's on. Uh the ads are a little strange on that website, but <laughs> uh you know, I think this is a great topic. There's definitely enough for us to talk about again uh sometime soon. Mm-hmm. So uh I, I look forward to the, the comments and questions that w- this will generate. Might, might be doing a button mosh very soon on one that might fall into a guilty uh, pleasure category, uh, Tokyo Mirage Sessions, which is a oh, spinoff of Persona. Yes. It, it's, that's... it looks like a really cool game, but like anyone who walks in on me playing it, they're going to be seeing and hearing J-pop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're probably not going to understand. Right. <laughs> I can't be your friend anymore. <laughs> So, so what's, what are those called? The models that do that? Um, pop stars, pop models. That's some Japanese oh, term for it. Pop idol. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Pop idol. There we go. I knew there was a term for that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, that'll be uh, maybe some interesting impressions yeah. that'll relate to this uh, topic. Well, I, I feel dirty now and I'm giving, <laughs> giving up video games forever. So there you go. Until until tomorrow, probably. Go home and take a shower, and it's not because we have the AC off to avoid background noise. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. No, I, 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 I'm going to go home and, and log on to the Minecraft server. There you I, go. I admit it. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode number 67 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. I'm Chris. I am your Spelling Bee champion, Jim. <laughs> and I'm the big loser doc. <laughs> and we'll see you next time. We want to join your discussion, because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, backward-compatible.com. And we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening.
Until next time, stay compatible. Backward compatible. <laughs>